Hi there, my name is Ron Rogers, and this presentation is titled Pilot Induced Oscillations and Aircraft Structural Modes on the Boeing 777. Now, when the 777 first came into service with United Airlines in June of 1995, there were some rumors floating around about uh, not very good flight characteristics, and, and uh, those who fly the uh, 777 now or have flown on it are probably going, Really? That's a great aircraft. And great handling and flying qualities and it's just just a pleasure to fly but it was starting to get a bad reputation kind of like the 727 did at its initial entry and you probably some people are going the 27 yep thanks to captain k meyer in part but the 27 was getting some bad press even time magazine was had an article about oh the fuel lines run next to the fuselage and if it lands gear up and just all sorts of stuff about the airplane and uh, these uh, straight wing pilots were flying a swept wing now and it was getting into problems, which it did. Um, so it was starting to get a bad reputation, the 27. And the 777, I didn't want to see it go along uh, that same route. Now, I was um, in charge of the ALPA National Airline Pilot Association National New Aircraft Evaluation and Certification Committee. And one of the things I did on that committee was we conducted a lot of flight evaluations on all the transport aircraft. I've, I've flown quite a number of aircraft, and, I'm, and in future um, presentations, I'm going to I'm going to talk about those aircraft and the flight evaluations, flight tests, and stuff like that. But the Triple Seven was one of the aircraft I was involved in early on, and it was getting this reputation. Um, Part of it was because initially in flight tests, they uh, uh, did some high gain tracking stuff. And high gain means it's just a lot of inputs from the pilot to try to maintain a very precise flight path. And they do this by actually pulling into a refueling position. Now, management would probably love the ability to refuel the 777. Pilots, not so much. But uh, uh, that's how they get into a position where they can do the high gain task, where it, uh, it takes precise tracking, um, which which you also do in a landing configuration, but it's much easier to do it up and away. And uh, John Cashman got into a few uh, pilot-induced oscillations, and at one point he had to put his feet on the glare shield and brace his arms to, to stop it. But, uh, you know, it was, it was corrected because it doesn't matter if you have a mechanical flight control system or electronic one, you can get unwanted responses in the flight controls. And, uh, you know, in mechanical aircraft, they use springs, they use bob weights, they use things like that. In electronic aircraft, you adjust the uh, electronics, the software. So, um, as you probably know, there's a lot been written about uh, PIOs, pilot-induced oscillations. Well, the book on the right <clears throat> was trying to kind of uh, take it back to the point of being uh, not blaming the pilot, because PIO, pilot-induced oscillation, well, it's the pilot's uh, fault there, kind of like uh, the issue that happened with the uh, space shuttle and the approach and landing tests, which I may talk about later, uh, the issues they got into. Um, <clears throat> but uh, they were trying to change it to a softer uh, aircraft pilot coupling, because that's really what it is. No, no pilot goes out there and says, ah, let me see what I can do with this thing. You know, I'm going to get this thing into an oscillation. No, they don't do that. It's, it's the coupling between the pilot and the aircraft. So it's a little less uh, derogatory uh, towards the pilot. But, okay. I was out on a, a flight evaluation. The first one was a five-hour long evaluation. And here's some of the people in the evaluation. We got some British Airways pilots, and we got me. Um, uh, that's me there in the center with the arrow. Uh, you probably don't recognize me because I don't have gray hair. Uh, it was actually still blonde back then. But uh, the thing behind us is the main landing gear of the 777. And notice how uh, far those flaps come down. That's pretty impressive. But there's the main landing gear. It's got... Uh, six tires on each side, uh, on each side of the aircraft, three uh, on each side of the bogey. And that's important. If you don't know what a bogey is, that's that big thing that holds the gear back there. And each of these uh, landing gear weigh 10,000 pounds. Now imagine the hydraulics it takes to lift that uh, up in a, in a very quick fashion. That's a, a very big actuator there. That's two of my F-150 pickup trucks it has to lift in uh, just a few seconds up into the wheel well. And there's the uh, flight test aircraft we used. Um, 
these aircraft, you know, they don't just scrap them. Uh, it's too expensive, really, to keep one at the uh, the manufacturer, really, uh, for the most part. So um, they use a uh, they use one of the airline's aircraft that uh, later go to the airline. And I uh, when I sat down this uh, aircraft later when it was uh, with United Airlines as pilot. I recognized it as being one of the flight test aircraft. And I told my co-pilot, oh, I've stalled this aircraft. And he goes, what? I go, yeah, I've stalled it. And he goes, you mean you, you got the stick shaker? And I go, no, 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 no. That's approach to stall. I had this thing in full stall, and it really bucks. It's amazing. It gets a really bucking action. He's kind of looking at me like, do I want to fly with this guy? And I go, okay, it was in flight test. Never mind. Don't get worried. And there's us standing in the engine, and that's a big engine. Uh, you can tell. Now, if I reach my hand over my head, it's still another 17 inches before I can uh, touch the uh, top of that cowling. So, that's a big engine. A lot of power. All right. Here's me uh, in the aircraft. That's John Cashman, the chief test pilot. Uh, John was a great guy. He had an encyclopedic knowledge of aircraft. It was uh, It was amazing. And if that wasn't good enough... Uh, you go into his office and you ask him a question and he can go right to the book, the reference, and pull it out and get it to you. Now, one thing I might mention, uh, John pointed this out to me, that when somebody gives you a corner office, you want to ask which corner. His corner office looked into the uh, the parking lot. The head of flight test actually looked out to the runway. Now, later John became the head of the flight test and he got the better office, but I digress. Now, we went up on this flight evaluation and I had prepared a very detailed evaluation. This was a five-hour flight. Um, a very detailed uh, uh, evaluation, and John kind of joked that it was sufficient for uh, certification. Of course, it's not, but uh, it was detailed. Now, on our first flight, one of the pilots, it wasn't me, uh, doesn't really mean anything, but one of the pilots uh, got into a uh, three hertz, three cycle, you know, uh, you uh, electrical engineers out there, you probably have your hertz to cycle uh, conversion graph. Anyway, uh, a, a three hertz PIO. Now, this occurred during a 30 degree flap simulated single engine approach. On short final, the pilot uh, that was flying made a pulse input to the controls. That's that's what uh, some pilots do when they're not sure of the response of an aircraft. Instead of knowing smoothly where they can put the control, they'll make a little pulse and see how it reacts. And then you make a pulse the other way. That's not great flying, but it was kind of interesting because um, test pilots fly aircraft differently than airline pilots. And it's kind of funny, but um, it was very useful to the um, manufacturer to have us airline pilots come out and fly. Because we do things in airliners that test pilots don't do. And, uh, you know, be that as it may, we, we tend to fly just a little bit differently. And they had not seen this before. And it was kind of interesting. We, uh, it, it caused a longitudinal, that's the long length, length down the aircraft, a little longitudinal uh, flexing. These aircraft, you know, it's... it's uh, um, 100, uh, 200 feet long. And, uh, you know, you get that much aluminum, especially when it's like, well, it gets a little, it gets a little flexible. So this thing started flexing and we got this little PIO and it was recorded on the data. And a couple days later, John calls me up and he says, Hey, we saw what happened there. And, uh, we figured out how to correct it. They put it a little, uh, three Hertz filter in the uh, flight control system. And, uh, that did away with it. And it was real interesting. Um, <clears throat> when I was chairman of the Alpa New Aircraft Committee, we had a very good relationship with all the manufacturers, and we had some very good discussions. And I can, I'll can i tell you in another video about why it's good to have a few glasses of wine in the debrief with the Airbus pilots, and you'll learn stuff that they weren't, uh, you know, vino veritas, you know, in, in Wine is Truth. You'll find out stuff that they were a little ne uh, neglectful to tell you earlier, but if you press them enough with a few glasses of wine, you can find out the true story, and it's, it's a lot of fun that you find out things that um, uh, can be quite interesting. So um, now uh, moving on, we did a we did a, a later evaluation, and this is kind of interesting. Now I I gotta give Boeing credit for this because they resolved an issue that you're just not going to see in airline flying for a, a number of reasons. But this was a little quirky thing uh, that we got I involved in. And I'm, I'm going to have to read it off my little, you know, if you got your 90, uh, 1995 October uh, copy of the Airline Pilots magazine, you, you can read this. It's a little complicated, so I'm, I kind of need uh, uh, to go uh, through it with. But um, one of the members was uh, performing a... Um, a landing in uh, direct 
law or direct control. Uh, Airbus calls it direct law. Uh, there's a little switch above the head there. Oh, and, and by the blue, the way, the blue arrows, those are a flight test instrumentation. This is a flight test aircraft. All the uh, flight test engineers are in the back. There's no interior. There's only about uh, 10 seats in the back. And I told Boeing, I said, you got to put more seats on this. Or you're just not going to make any money. But anyway, it's a flight test aircraft. So, um, and that's instrumentation that the pilots can use. The one on the left shows a rate of Excel deceleration because you want a very uh, one knot per second decelerate when you're doing stalls. But I'm digressing here. Now, back back to the thing at hand. So um, we uh, went on this flight and they almost thought about canceling it because uh, we had an air ground sensor that was inoperative. Now, they got three ways of doing air ground sensing. And uh, the software needs two out of three. And they said, hey, we got two out of three. So, okay, we're going to be fine. Now, we were doing an approach um, flying in uh, direct law, flight computers off, which give you kind of help. The airplane natural flight dynamics is great without the flight computers, really. It, it flies like a 67, basically. So uh, we had one of the pilots doing a 30-degree direct, uh, cro not crosswind, and uh, he came in with the... Um, with the flight controls off. Now, we were doing a touch and go, which is another thing I've done in all the major airlines, which you don't typically get to do, uh, and uh, V1 cuts and stuff like that. But we're doing, uh, uh, we were doing a touch and go, and the airplane needs two out of the three sensors. Well, what happened was with the flight control um, system off, when um, the airplane, when we, when we touched down, uh, they switched the flight control uh, computers back on. But in the process, because of the uh, inoperative air ground sensor, um, the uh, airplane was trimming all the while we were slowing down the runway. We slowed down to about 60 knots. Now, when we put the power in, okay, no passengers. Uh, we're at the end of the flight, so there's not a whole bunch of fuel on. This is a lightweight aircraft, and of course, we don't use reduced thrust in the, the flight test activities. It's full thrust. So the engines come in, and this thing accelerates very rapidly, and it uh, it was very out of trim. Um, and uh, when uh, uh, the aircraft came off uh, the, the ground, uh, it, the uh, stick forces were, uh, were very high. So, uh, case... Uh, we came off the ground. Uh, now, one of the sensors is the uh, radar altimeter, which tells you on the ground. The other sensor is why I told you about that bogey thing, because there's bogey rotation. When you come off, the bogey rotates, uh, or when you touch down, it derotates, and that says, hey, because it does that, there's weight on wheels, you know you're on the ground. Well, uh, with the uh, PFCs, didn't sense the primary flight computers since they were off. They didn't sense the bogey rotation. So two out of the three air ground systems were off. The airplane thought it was in the air. <clears throat> we got way out of trim. So when we came off, uh, the aircraft was was quite a bit out of trim. And uh, it, it caused a very high stick forces. Not exactly a PIO, but very high stick forces. And it made it uh, some interesting and difficult uh, flying momentarily as the aircraft does its automatic uh, uh, retrim. So, um, Boeing said, well, we're going to correct that. I don't see how you'll ever see that in actual operation, but that's how thorough they were in this whole thing. All right. So that's a discussion of the longitudinal, uh, PIO. Now there's also a lateral one. Now, you know, these aircraft, they got a lot of parts, a lot of structure, a lot of pieces, and, um, you know, it's a long aircraft. It can get loose in turbulence. It can get loose uh, by aggressive uh, inputs. Here's a little diagram showing uh, the various thickness of the structure and how it varies out through the wing. And, of course, the wings can flex. It's a long wing. It's about 100 feet out there, so it's a long wing, and there's a lot of parts to it, a lot of flaps and slats and uh, other structures. And I was taking off on an initial flight, and uh, I'm taking off, uh, and I'm being rather aggressive in the aileron use, putting inputs in rather quickly, keeping the thing level. And I mentioned to the test pilot that time, who was Frank Santoni, another uh, really super guy, um, I mentioned to him that, oh, there's a lot of turbulence. And he goes, it's you. And he goes, what? He says, 
He says, stop putting the inputs in the ailerons. And I stopped, and the turbulence went away. Well, it's interesting. There's a 2.6 hertz lateral structural mode. And I found a lot of my co-pilots, uh, when I was uh, checking them out in the aircraft, they would, they would try to be very aggressive in the uh, aileron input, and they were exciting this mode. Uh, and if uh, you got the green arrow there, you take and make a sharp input into the aileron, it starts a little shock wave that propagates where that uh, yellow arrow is, and it propagates up the wing, and you feel it. So they would do that, and I'd say, let me have the aircraft for just a minute. And I'd say, okay, watch this, which is, of course, typically very bad words to say in any aviation experience, but I'd say, watch this. So I'd do blop, blop, like that, and then boom, boom, we'd get the lateral. I said, see that? And go blop, blop, boom, boom, we get it. Okay, you need to be smooth. Otherwise, you excite that lateral structural mode. And... Uh, uh, hopefully uh, they pass that good information on because I'm long retired. But anyway, that's some of the initial uh, flight test we did in the 777 uh, coming up to certification. And I absolutely love the aircraft. I was 13 years on it as a captain, most of that as a line check airman uh, giving instruction and check rides. And uh, for my work, uh, it was very nice. I got a, uh, a letter from uh, Chet Ekstrand, who was the vice president of certification and government uh, technical liaison, where um, he appreciated uh, the work I had done uh, with through the committee as chairman of the committee um, and the acceptance of the Boeing uh, 777 airplane. Uh, kind of quelled some nasty rumors that were getting uh, started and um, uh, just had, a, had a, a great time with the aircraft. And, of course, this is my final flight, my final takeoff out of Maui. I got the water cannon uh, salute on my trip. Uh, I had uh, 12 members of my family, 13 including me, but I didn't need a seat in the back, obviously. Uh, took them out there to Maui for a week as my uh, final flight. And uh, had the, uh, the wa they called a water lay when you get the rainbow uh, like that. Um, occurred really just by chance. Uh, I didn't even know this was going to occur until we did the picture. And... Uh, uh, Came back home and set the parking brake in uh, August of 2015, and uh, I missed I missed the airplane, I missed the flying, I missed the layovers, I missed the people, and I missed the cruise. I do not miss the jet lag. Anyway, uh, I know this is a little long and technical. Hopefully, you stayed with me through most of it. And uh, anyway, thanks for watching.